So what are sponge cities? They're very cool is the first thing. Um, so they work with water rather than against it. So um, they're less about trying to get rid of water. So at the moment we sort of funnel all our water off in pipes and drains as far you know, to get it away from us as fast as possible. But sponge cities are more about making space for water, valuing it, trying to purify it and recycle it where possible as well. So it's, it's good for droughts, not just for, for floods, uh, for avoiding them, I should say. <laughs> um, the techniques for sponge cities are not new, though the scale of it is, so the size of it, it's a city-wide catchment level approach. Um, here in New Zealand, we often use a development um, approach known as water sensitive urban design, which is basically a sponge cities approach at a, a much smaller scale. Um, so sponge cities is about putting that water sensitive urban design sort of process on steroids, making it consistent across all cities and towns, um, rather than just using it in some places some of the time. Um, it, sponge cities, I think, um, when I was researching it, it felt very right um, that it sits alongside Mātauranga Māori, um, which for those not New Zealand means traditional knowledge and wisdom. Um, and this sort of sees human as just one, humans as just one part of the environment. So the environment is something to work on behalf of rather than something to be controlled or dominated. Uh, and another key component of sponge cities is that we have to make space for water. So move people out of the way. <laughs> um, we have to acknowledge, I guess, that <clears throat> towns are going to be more watery and make sure that we're not building on those places that are particularly vulnerable to flooding or will be in the future. Um, and finally, um, I, we've defined sponge cities as sitting within the nature-based approach. Um, nature-based solutions is an international term which is becoming more and more accepted here. And it's basically about trying to be holistic and trying to attach, attack a whole lot of different problems at the same time. So rather than just focusing on stormwater management, we're focusing on uh, improving biodiversity um, and making cities nicer places to live as well. So I thought it'd be good to share a couple of um, case studies. So the idea originated, well, the, I guess the terminology, but maybe not the idea, originated in China. Um, and China has 30 large scale pilot projects um, covering cities across the country. And so they're a good, they have a lot of good case studies that you can look at to see how the sponge cities model is working. So this is, these are some pictures of Haiku City in Hainan Island. And Hainan Island was picked as one of the Chinese sponge cities leading demonstration sites because it was flooding frequently, it was very polluted, uh, there was a lot of habitat loss. Um, so the city's a bit bigger than Auckland. <coughs> Excuse me, what they did was um, they integrated areas that were at risk of flooding with wetlands, ponds, rice paddies, parks, and coastal habitats and sort of <coughs> formed a a holistic sponge city system across the whole city to which would retain clean and recycle water. Um, they moved buildings from floodplains um, and they replaced concrete flood walls with um, embankment, embankments made from earth and vegetation. Um, and alongside the river there, you can see in that picture, they, they planted terraced wetlands. Um, and those the plants that they use um, are ones that can help to recycle the water so that when it reaches the river, it's um, been purified. Um, and then they also work to make spaces beautiful and good for both humans and biodiversity. And so you can see there some raised pathways through the mangroves um, alongside the river. The next example I chose was Singapore. Um, Singapore, the reason I chose it is it's got an average monthly rainfall of nearly twice that of Auckland because it, it has um, monsoons. So they had major flood events there in 2010, 2011. And since then they've been building their city to be more and more resilient using green and blue infrastructure. So they've invigorated the wetlands, um, they've daylighted river channels. So rivers that had been concreted over and put through pipes have been resurfaced and naturalized back to the way they were before. Um, and in some cases they've also been deepened and widened. Uh, they've planted native, um, native trees alongside rivers to absorb um, and filter stormwater runoff. And they've also added rooftop gardens um, and lots more green and blue spaces overall. Um, and the result is that the flood prone areas have reduced from something like 3,200 hectares in the city to just um, 30 hectares today. So only 1% of what the flood areas were before. Does it still flood there? Yep, it does. They have flash floods because they have monsoons. Um, but what 
what they find now is that those floods um, go down really quickly within an hour and they're not flooding houses uh, in the same way as they were before. So it's a, it's a big success.